everybody, we haven't had a case since March. And just uh, as it happens, I was just talking with some of my family about some stuff. So th these people are my family and I thought it would be a great session to talk about it, but we'll keep it super short because I really wanna hear Dr. Swagger speak. Um, but so basically you guys can read through most of this, but um, two children, the first is a seven year old male. Uh, he was fostered and then adopted around age five, um, has been with the family since he was two. Um, physically, he's very small, but he, he seems totally fine, very acrobatic. <laughs> um, the, some of the behavioral things that are starting to come up now is that he really doesn't seem to care to listen um, at all, and he doesn't really seem to care about if he is punished, if he isn't punished, if he, if he gets too frustrated, he'll just go lay on his own anyway. Um, and... Uh, and of course, one of the other things is that he is still wearing pull-ups to bed um, and doesn't really seem to have, I don't know, the want to, to stop that. And so if, if we put pull-ups on him too early, he actually will wet them while he's still awake. Um, he, he doesn't really, I don't know, he, he's a wonderful little boy. He loves playing with his brothers. He loves swimming. He's very but he doesn't seem terribly emotionally connected to, to people despite what they, they try to, and, and I can totally understand not being lovey-dovey with everybody, I get that, but he doesn't really seem extremely connected to a lot of people. Um, he was supposed to be, per foster care, he was supposed to have a state case manager, um, and that hasn't really kept up very well. He went to therapy once, um, in a different part of the state and the lady I guess that they saw like was described to me as old school and that she wasn't terribly concerned about anything just wait and see what happens and um and he came his background I guess before he was two um he was put into foster care because of some some drug use in the family and then some death eventually from that as well um so that's really him. The other one is this three-year-old female. She's been with the family since she was three months old. She's absolutely beautiful. And she was so, so small when, when she first came. Um, and she is still very, very small, but she is so smart. She talks and runs and swims and does all of the fun things. Um, again, she is very small. Uh, so she was put into foster care after um, she was hit in the head as, when she was four months old, and then she was hospitalized, and then they, they realized that there had probably been some previous um, abuse. So, uh, but she's been with them since she was four months old, and she seems to be doing very well. She, she did have a lot of um, sickness, and she had several hospitalizations for croup and RSV, but thankfully, since COVID has shut down the preschools and everything, she's actually been right as rain. She hasn't she's gotten super hyper because she hasn't been sick at all, and now she runs around a ton. Um, so hopeful, we're hoping, of course, that nothing is, is awry there, um, but just really to look out for anything. Um, with her as well, there was some drug use in the family. Um, I think the father was the perpetrator of most of the abuse. Um, he's been jailed on unrelated charges. And then the mother really just never showed up after that. Um, but that, that's basically it. I guess the question is about some behavioral aspects for um, the little boy, especially since he's in school a lot, well, going to be in school a lot again someday. And, uh, and then just anything to watch out for. Thank you, that was excellent. Um, any comments, feedback, thoughts, recommendations? Caitlin, how old is the little girl now? She's three. Okay. And some, for the seven-year-old, some of the, the behaviors, are they kind of new behaviors, like some of that withdrawal and not caring and social challenges? Are those new or are those a continued concern that that is kind of getting worse? I think it's growing. 
I don't think he was ever terribly connected. Um, but like, so I mean, connected to like his parents or, or kind of caregivers. He seems to be totally fine with, with siblings, you know, with people he can have fun with, but he doesn't really seem to, to be terribly lovey dovey with, with parents or grandparents. And he doesn't really seem to care if they, you know, say early bedtime, if you don't do this or that, you know, it doesn't really. And I think that was happening a lot, not when he was two really, of course, but it's been getting a little worse. But I think the continued bedwetting alongside all of that is kind of where more of the distress is coming in. Well, and I would have some medical questions about the, the bedwetting. Um, you know, one of the, especially with some of the behaviors too, um, we, we miss so much sleep apnea in kids um, that, that the bedwetting um, is, is certainly kind of up there. Um, so trying, trying to find out if he snores, if he's having a lot of frequent awakening. So any disruption in that sleep, kids should not snore. So any, any child that um, snores probably needs a little bit more investigation if there's any snoring. But, you know, if you're having little micro arousals during the day because something's going on with your sleep, you're going to see that wedding, you're going to see that fatigue, that withdrawal, that problem engaging, and it can be really life changing. And even if it's a mild obstruction, they can have profound functional impairments. So um, from a medical standpoint, I'd be a little bit more curious about the, the, the sleep and, and to, to kind of find out if he'd ever been continent um, at night or if it's always been, always been that way or if it was a regression. Do you know any of that information? Um, I, I don't think he's ever gone without pull-ups. Um, it took a while to get him out of diapers, but of course he is out of diapers now, but uh, uh, pull-ups at nighttime. Um, I'm trying to think as far as sleep, I, I don't think he snores and I don't think he wakes up very often. He wakes up early, but I think a lot of kids wake up early because when they wake me up at 6 a.m. and I don't want to get up, that's when I, you know, but, but nothing crazy or anything. Yeah, I think I, um, I think I agree with Lauren on that. I think, um, definitely, um, check for some tonsillar hypertrophy. Um, anything mild like that, most of the time that will cause snoring, but mm -hmm. sometimes not even snoring. Um, and, you know, an ENT referral would, would definitely not be a bad idea. Also ask about constipation. Constipation can definitely cause some nocturnal enuresis in kiddos who are especially continent during the day, but not at night. Um, they just, their bladder can't expand because they're already full of stool in there. So their bladder can't expand um, and hold that urine all night long. So they end up having accidents. Um, also, you know, how much are we drinking? Are we allowed to just, you know, drink, 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 drink all day long? Um, you know, diet modifications can be important, which, you know, will also lead to the constipation as well. Um, so yeah, make sure those physical um, medical things are not going on first before we start looking into, is this more of a psychological problem? Yeah, that's perfect. So would you guys recommend um, getting a referral from primary care or making an appointment? With I would someone? start by making an appointment with their primary care provider to, to assess all this medical stuff. And then they can definitely make a referral if, if it doesn't seem medical. Because um, there's definitely, and, and maybe I'll sort of punt to Amanda a little bit on this, um, but we definitely, you know, those kids with early history and neglect, we, we definitely see attachment concerns right alongside the medical ones too. And while it may not be a full attachment disorder, there's a lot of like ideas that you can do to build attachment with your caregivers to learn how to connect with them and, and interact. And this is a really critical age because most kids listen because they want to please the caregiver and they see the caregiver as someone that they respect and want to get their praise. And so if, if that connection isn't there, none of the behavioral management stuff works very well um, until we do that. And so I, that, this is what Amanda does all day long. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I, can, I can defer those tips and tricks to build attachment to her. Yeah, so I, you know, how does he respond or how do they handle it when they, when they do tell him like, if you don't go inside, you're going to lose whatever, or, do they follow through with that or 
do they let it go because they don't see a response from him or how's it handled? Yeah, norm so normally it's early bedtime. That's kind of the go-to um, with all of the kids and stuff. And, and normally it is, you know, followed through with. Um, he he kind of just, he does this like shut down thing where wherever he is, if he just, I don't know, it's, it's kind of funny, but obviously I shouldn't laugh at things going on, but he'll just stop wherever he is and just lay down on the ground or wherever he, and just lay there. And if you let him, he'll lay there for like, an hour doing nothing yeah. and I'm like what are you doing so then I, well it's awful but I'll like squirt him with a squirt gun or something like that and make him get up like I'm probably not the best person to be talking about stuff like this but I don't know I don't know how effective your squirt gun's gonna be but I'm just saying <laughs> no but I, I definitely agree <laughs> yeah I definitely agree. Um, you know, rule out all medical before you look at psychological. But I think that, you know, when you're looking at a behavioral approach, and especially, and, and like Dr. Swagger said, we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of attachment issues with kids who are going through the foster system and who have been adopted. And, you know, he doesn't, he clearly doesn't trust adults, right? So that's where he's having a difficult time making and forming those relationships. So he's identified to be able to do that amongst his peers, amongst his siblings. Um, he doesn't trust adults. He didn't have a, you know, he, it sounds like he had trauma initially and then an inconsistent, um, you know, uh, uh, case manager at the beginning that can even have a huge impact on foster kids because they're looking for at least one consistent adult in their lives. That's going to follow through with something even that young. So that can have an impact, but when you're looking at behavioral approaches, you know, especially, and I see this with foster kids all the time they seem to go through this honeymoon phase once they're adopted like from anywhere from two months to three years right <laughs> and then when these expectations are put in place um they try to fight them a little bit because they want to make sure that that adult is still going to be there regardless of what they do um they try to have good behaviors but they just can't at times and so then they fear that rejection so they reject that adult before they can even get there um so as far as behavioral pieces, it's really interesting because rewards can be really beneficial. So a lot of the times, um, you know, taking something away is definitely a behavioral approach. But when you're working with kids who have been exposed in utero or um, have early exposure to substance use disorders, that that same in, in trauma too early on, that same brain, like in the brain, like that same circulatory system where that trauma piece is, is also stimulated by rewards. And so some of that emotion they're already feeling can be motivated and driven by rewards. So I talk with parents about how to implement rewards and how to um, increase behavior through rewards. Uh, they definitely see a, a difference with children who have been through the foster care when you do that, when you start incorporating more rewards. But it sounds like to me, I think the amazing piece is I'm going to encourage you to not squirt with the squirt gun <laughs> and let him lay in the grass. Yeah. Um, it sounds like to me like he's regulating himself. You know, there's a lot of, when there's exposure in utero and a lot of trauma early on, that dysregulation is is key in kids, and and we see it amongst a lot of kids, which um, is where the temper tantrums come about. And so, so I definitely, um, I definitely think that that's a good thing that he just kind of like stops and lays there and completely just regulates himself, right? And sometimes it takes an hour, sometimes it takes shorter. So, I mean, I would totally promote that in that's some fun. way, but the minute they promote it, they're going to get the opposite behavior with him, it sounds <laughs> like. But, um, you know, just kind of letting it, him go with that. But I, I think that that could be beneficial. I think also assessing, you know, developmentally where he's functioning at, um, because a lot of the times uh, adoptive parents and foster parents will look at their chronological age, you know, at seven years old and kind of meet him there. Um, but he might not be functioning there social emotionally. Uh, so he might need approached a little bit differently. And so, you know, after a medical evaluation kind of you know, see if, if any of those issues are not a factor, you know, where he's functioning developmentally uh, with a psychological evaluation could be beneficial. That's perfect. Thank you. I will say I'm not a caregiver. I'm just saying I'm only there for fun. So that's the only reason I have passed. I don't have kids. 
you know, I Listen. wonder if care, the caregivers themselves could use a little more education in dealing with a kid who's been through a traumatic um, experience. Um, you know, we, we go through the, as foster parents, we go through the pride training and, you know, we think it's kind of ridiculous that we have to, a lot of us, um, and just personally as a, as a, a foster parent, um, we think it's ridiculous because we've raised our own children and we're great parents. So why right. do this excess training? Um, and then even in the training, you're like, that's not going to happen to us. Um, and, and for me personally, it was my um, two nieces and my nephew that ended up in our home. And um, so I thought it's, we're not going to see any of this because there's already that unconditional love there. It's not, you know, we're, we're relative caregivers. So um, in hindsight, thank goodness we had the training that we had. Um, I really utilized a lot of it, but it still remained difficult. And I think there were times when, you know, there's a difference in loving and liking a child and really unconditionally loving them. When they've done, when a child's done bad and you're disciplining them, um, they still need to know that they're loved. And I didn't think that we would face that issue, but we did. So he could be shutting down, trying to process that, um, and any negative behavior gets a response. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more. I think that, and that's a lot of, you know, a lot of what I do in therapy is reconnecting parents. A lot of the times, just what you're saying, you know, they, they disconnect um, because they're frustrated or they're correcting and they're not getting a response. And so they disconnect, but it's really important with foster kids and adopted kids to reconnect. They need to know that you still love them. And it's kind of silly because you're frustrated at that time. But I talk with parents about checking in with themselves, you know, calming themselves down and coming back around. But I agree. I think parent support is a primary piece in foster care and, and dealing with adopted kids who have had early trauma experiences. Because a lot of the kids you're dealing with, um, kind of like the seven-year-old Caitlin that you're describing, you know, he doesn't seem to have an affect to some things. Like it doesn't seem like it affects him. He doesn't really look like he's responding. And a lot of the times those kids have a very difficult time with that because they've had to survive. They were in survival mode early on. And so they don't know how to appropriately um, know how they should be feeling and the affect they should be showing. And so, you know, parents kind of interpret that as like, this isn't impacting them but it does impact them. It impacts them differently. And so that's, and it's frustrating as a parent because you're not getting the typical responses or the typical interactions. And yes, I would think my niece cool. was looking through me. Like, I'm yeah. like, are you there? What, but I was yelling, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm a yeller. Like I grew up in a house with a yeller. So I'm yelling, not the right thing to do, such as the squirt gun, but I was yelling and, you know, I, like she's just looking at me and staring at me. And I'm like, are you even hearing what I'm saying mm -hmm. to you? And I thought it was this disconnect. And here I just needed to get down. I needed to get on her level and say, you know, I love you, but you cannot lie to me. And, right. you know, these will not, these are not behaviors that are tolerated here. And th just saying that I love you first has made a world of difference. Right. It like completely deflates that. Mm -hmm. That's really excellent. I do think a lot of parent training would help in this situation. Um, but absolutely, and I totally appreciate it. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, with that sort of idea of an oppositional or a bad behavior, I think parents go to thought, is they're ignoring me? Are they being oppositional? I think that's how our brains are kind of programmed. Trying to get to that psychoeducation piece about helping the caregiver understand the purpose of the behavior, because those those behaviors are often very purposeful and they're coming mm -hmm. from a place. If you can just get that that sort of reframe of how they approach it, that can really completely change outcomes. So going back, to just instead of just saying, "Oh, they're defiant, they're withdrawing," trying to step back and try to understand what's driving it can make a world of difference, and in those next steps. So. Um, Absolutely. That's perfect. I super appreciate it, everybody. Yeah, that was all such great insight and recommendations. I feel like you guys are all preparing me for when I become a parent. Too, so <laughs> thank you all. Um, that was excellent. And thank you so much, Caitlin, too, for that case. We appreciate it. Um, okay, so if uh, there are no other comments, thoughts, questions, um, we'll go on to the didactic portion. 
Uh, Dr. Slager, so I can pull up your PowerPoint. I, I, I got it. I think I figured it oh, out. Okay, yeah. awesome. We'll see. Um, Sounds so good. This is kind of long. I'm not sure if I'm going to get through it all, and that's okay. I probably need to do this in two parts. So we might try to focus on kind of assessment first and then kind of more treatment in the second half for a future lecture. But um, we'll, we'll see how far we get. I don't think I can see the chat very well. So if you can help me by reading any chat things if I'm in the share mode. That Absolutely. would be good. And, and as always, I like to be interrupted. I don't know if you let me talk. I don't like that. So interrupt me if there's a question. <laughs> Let's see if I can share this with you. all Okay, everybody see that okay? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I first want to thank, this is one of our child fellows. Um, he gave this presentation for Grand Rounds and I put it together very last minute. And so I borrowed heavily on his slides and changed a lot of things, but I want to make sure he gets credit. So thank you, Dr. Scott. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think anxiety disorders is probably one of my, my favorite things to look at. And it fits really nicely with your case, uh, Caitlin, because um, I think anxiety disorders are so easy to miss in kids um, because they often don't look like anxiety. They, they often look like behavior problems. Um, and I would probably tell you if you even just take something like aggression, which is a pretty common complaint, I would say that about 80% of the time in kids um, anxiety may be much more of a factor driving um, it than, than anything else. So anxiety um, can include a lot of things. And we'll talk a little bit differently is, is that fear and anxiety are a little bit different. Um, fear can be this really primal, hardwired body response that we can really not control. And it's an intense reaction emotionally to just the idea of threat. Um, it's meant to keep us safe. We, were, we, we really have that system to perceive fear and, and figure out how to stay safe. Um, that's pretty hardwired. Anxiety is, is more of a, a cognitive word in our heads that allows you to have to have perceive and sort of anticipate. It requires kind of higher order um, cognitive function to really to get to that term anxiety. So, so lots of young kids, especially under 10, might not be able to use the word anxiety. And, and may understand words more like fear, scared, much more easily. So um, sometimes understanding how the kid can talk about it can be part of the assessment that we're gonna talk about too. And, and you can have anxiety about all sorts of things. Um, and and here's, here's you know some of the, the faves. Um, but not all anxiety is bad. And this is sort of like trying to understand where the developmental level are. You know, part of, part of why we can sense fear is to protect ourselves. And so if you think about normal development, we're supposed to be afraid of certain things at different times. And to truly have a disorder, they have to really be, it has to be really functionally impairing and beyond what's anticipated. So if you think about babies, the goal of babies is to feel safe and attached to a loved one designed to care for them. They need all their needs met. And so you don't want them to be super excited by strangers. You really want to build that attachment. And so what are infants afraid of? What impacts their world? Loud noises, being startled, fear of being dropped. Um, you can see this sort of um, heightened startle response that can happen that has to sort of be self regulate This is sort of how you develop some of that self-regulation too, is to be able to manage the anxiety as you go forward. You know, with, with toddlers and little kids, we, we ha see rich, imaginative, magical thinking processes. And so they often can be scared of their own imagination and you may see them being scared of the dark and, and monsters and these more magical things. And, and you know, that's hard as a, as a parent because we wanna say, oh, monsters aren't real, you shouldn't be afraid of them. But the reality is that's probably not the best way to approach it because to that child, that monster is real. And so helping that child gain a sense of control over the monsters may be a better way to approach a developmental anxiety. I'll give you an example. You know, you could sit there and talk to a four-year-old about how monsters aren't real and there's no monster under the bed or you can give them magical spray water and let them spray the bed that keeps the monsters away and engage them in a developmentally appropriate task to feel in control of that anxiety. And so um, recognizing it as development may, may change the way you approach it versus if it's, it's functionally impairing. 
in school age children, as they sort of start owning their own bodies and recognizing that their body is kind of theirs, you might see more themes of control, but you also see fear responses to, to we call this the boo-boo stage, where they're afraid something's going to happen to their bodies. And so they, they may be afraid, they may be more afraid of medical procedures or getting an injection, or this is, this is when kids... Um, are like watching the hurricanes or tornadoes over and over again on TV, how they can get really scared and not really realize it's happening miles and miles away. This is happening with kids with the coronavirus, right? They already have a sense of fear about health and they're seeing all this information. You may really see a very developmental anxiety sort of being occurring in, in this age group because of, of, of COVID. Older kids start worrying about who am I? We, that's sort of from Amanda's lecture um, last time, and they start thinking about who do I want to be? Am I fitting in? Am I going to be healthy? What They start thinking about the future and having sort of anticipation anxieties um, that, that may occur. And you can also have themes of separation at different times too. And so, uh, you know, with, with every psychiatric disorder, not only is it just, well, what is the anxiety and is it appropriate or not, but how, how impairing is it functionally? You know, if, if I'm worried about strangers, um, that's one thing, but if I'm worried about strangers and I won't leave my house to go to school, that's where you really label that this is now a functional problem and you cross that line into maybe being an anxiety disorder. So anxiety disorders are really common. They're probably one of the most common um, conditions. Um, you can see rates up to a third um, of, of kids at some point. And, and often the anxiety comes before um, the behavior problem, um, but lots of comorbidities with depression. It can be the great mimicker of all things. And, and often even in older adolescents, we see very high rates of substance abuse in kids that suffered from anxiety, especially alcohol. They begin using alcohol or even marijuana to self-medicate very long-standing anxiety disorders that have often been there since, since they were young. So it really is something to identify and try to engage as soon as you are able. Um, and the number one rule about anxiety disorders is they probably have another anxiety disorder. So it's not uncommon that you might see a, a child with three anxiety disorders um, listed. If you think about, we're going to go through some of the criteria for anxiety disorders, but they all sort of are driven by different sort of triggers. And, and so they, they may have anxiety in one area, but they may have it in multiple. And, and it's important to kind of realize that. Um, there's also very high rates of depression associated with social anxiety, especially as they become adolescents. Panic disorder um, is very frequently following separation anxieties. So um, kids with separation anxiety when they're or, or older, um, I mean, when they have separation anxiety, that tantrum throwing that might occur in a separation can, can be kind of the age equivalent of a panic attack um, that, that they might experience. And there's a very high correlation between separation anxiety and moving to panic disorder. Um, you can frequently see like selective mutism, which is not talking in social situations with um, other social anxiety disorders too. And, um, the other really interesting part here is I, I want to just sort of say this is that um, anxiety disorders are incredibly common in ADHD. Um, and this, this, this is an important point when we get to treatment, but untreated ADHD, like not being able to pay attention, can be incredibly anxiety provoking. So a, a kid that may not be listening may have disruptive behaviors or look like they're not caring about things. Um, but if they have the ability to realize they're missing it or they can't control their focus, they can become incredibly anxious about being inattentive and missing things. And you can get a very stuck cycle um, with those kids. Um, and for a long time, people were afraid to give kids with ADHD stimulants if they had an anxiety disorder because there was fear that a stimulant would make anxiety disorders worse. And that's not really shown to be the case. In fact, in a big giant 30,000 kids study, they showed that treating ADHD, if the ADHD was really there, it wasn't, it wasn't, the, it was the truly the right diagnosis. It wasn't ADHD mistaken, um, a mistaken diagnosis for anxiety. 
they, they showed improvement in the children's anxiety just by treating the ADHD. So sometimes when you have both, you're trying to play what's the chicken or the egg, which came first, but um, it's, it's really important to, to acknowledge that, that comorbidity. So from kind of a, a biological perspective, we know that we, are, we, we were set up to be anxious. It was sort of protectionistic, it was survivalist. We couldn't live if we weren't scared. It's how we stay alive. Um, but when you constantly have an anxiety disorder and that system is going haywire, um, then that's not good either. And so what might set us up for anxiety disorders? So anxiety disorders are incredibly heritable. They run in families, and so it's not uncommon, and, and this is also that point of psychoeducation with families. It's not uncommon that I, I see parents that tell me they have anxiety disorders or depression, and they give me this very internalizing sort of cognitive description of worries, but they have a child presenting with a disruptive behavior. And it's very hard for them sometimes to understand that the child's presentation might be from anxiety because it's different than the way they um, experience anxiety. And so, but at the same time, that those, those disorders very much run in families. And so not only do you have to do psychoeducation about anxiety disorders, but sometimes you have to educate how anxiety disorders look different in kids um, because the parents may have had a different experience with that. We know that, that um, temperamental traits can, can be sort of persistent. So kids that are kind of shy or quiet or kind of in, inhibited, like they, they just sort of shut down. And so that case today was a kid that shuts down kind of at baseline. They may be a little bit uh, uh, avoidant at baseline to be at risk to develop an anxiety disorder. Um, kids that have had chronic stress and chronic dysregulation of, of cortisol are at higher risk. Um, the, the insecure attachment can set you up. Um, we talk about sort of different parenting styles. Parenting styles that tend to be high demand, like do this because I say so, I'm the boss um, kind of things, can be problematic if not paired with the, the warmth. So kids do best with what we think high levels of sort of demand, but also high levels of warmth right alongside that with anxiety disorders. And we, we highlighted that today with that example can, can be a risk factor. On the flip side, if you are too involved in, a parent, as in parenting, and this is sort of where a lot of research is looking to the concept of like helicopter parenting, where you're constantly there to do things for their children, that can set them up for anxiety because they don't know how to do it themselves and they don't, they don't gain independence. So this is that fine dance we walk as parents to, to do just enough but not too much that, that can be really tough and it's different for every kid. Um, we were talking about this earlier today is that again, when anxiety disorders run in families, what behavior is the parent modeling that the child's picking up on? And so in some models, just working with the parents at managing their own anxiety can decrease the child's anxiety without even working directly with the child because of how the patient, parent is responding. You know, you can think about if a, you know, I'll give you an example. I, I have a, a parent has very significant OCD and anxiety. And this parent is so anxious about COVID right now, terrified of germs, trying to over control the situation, won't let the child have any direct contact out of fear. And again, some, some real things, but some also real perceived parental anxiety that's fueling a very difficult family dynamic. And how do you kind of bring the parent down to get a behavior pattern that message in the regulation of the parent-child dyad is really important. Um, bullying and neglect and social skills deficits can be huge drivers of that. Um, adverse childhood experiences, increased risks of anxiety disorders, any sense of community unsafety can, can cause that. So community violence or just general um, exposure to, to abnormal cortisol in utero can contribute. So again, here's that kind of concept of the difference between fear and anxiety or worry is that again, we have different processes that, that do that. So again, that fear response is really sort of rooted in our deep brain structures. This is that amygdala response. This is that firing system that happens without our control. So it is hardwired to make us scared. And people experience panic attacks and a phobic avoidant response when a fear, a, not a fear circuit is triggered, okay? 
when you think about worry or you think about anxiety or apprehension, that's this higher level cortical structure in the brain that that fear response has to rise up so that they label it and they see it. And so when you think about symptoms more like worry or obsessions or getting stuck, you, you, it's kind of beyond that initial fear response in a different level of the brain processing that information. So um, it's very hard to like CBT yourself out of a panic attack because you can't undo the, co you, you don't have time to think. Whereas if you really are just a worrier, CBT might, with more cognitive interventions, you might have the ability to pause and think about that because it's not being driven in this fear center. Does that make sense? Um, these, are, these are sort of complex systems and wiring in the brain, but there's lots of different neurotransmitters that sort of get triggered. And, and some of the medications address these, but um, norepinephrine and serotonin are often sort of um, acknowledged in sort of like cognitive anxiety and, and sort of panic attacks. So noradrenergic systems are like your adrenaline response. So it's like you get adrenaline rush um, that releases all this norepinephrine and, and sometimes dopamine that has a panic attack, sort of hyper aroused fear driver. Worry can be kind of um, a serotonin feature that gets stuck in some of the higher level cortical circles. GABA is um, our, our brain sort of breaks. So GABA kind of helps people relax. And so benzodiazepines like Xanax and Valium try to trigger this relaxation system a little bit in the brain to sort of stop that fear response circuitry that may happen. Um, and this is a big giant question mark here, and this warrants its whole separate conversation, but there is a role of the endocannabinoids in anxiety. We don't really understand it very well. And this is why you get wild responses sometimes, I think, with people that are using marijuana. So there are people that swear by marijuana is the only thing in the world that helps their anxiety. But then other people that describe like I, feeling better, but then almost this recurrent worsening rebound anxiety with like panic and almost paranoia that can 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 worsen. And there's probably some genetic drivers of this, but um, some people are trying to look at the difference between like THC versus CBD and how how these systems kind of play out. And it's much more complicated than this. But when you see people talking about CBD, they're thinking like that might be more like less anxiety provoking where THC might be more anxiety provoking and, and all that. And the truth is we really haven't worked any of it out. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think as people get more interested in, in marijuana and it becomes quote legal, um, we'll, we'll see, but there, there's something there, but very poorly understood. Um, so just really quickly, again, this is the book we use to, to give kit, uh, diagnostic criteria Many of these for kids aren't that different than adults. So there's some, some, some differences in some of them, but many of these are the same wording that you see with adults. So separation anxiety disorder used to, we used to only think it could occur in children and adolescents. And, and they have shown in some more recent studies that adults can experience separation anxiety disorders too, but they do seem to be um, uh, a big focus in, in pediatrics. And this is sort of where some of that attachment behavior plays a really big role. So you have to be kind of cognitively able to understand um, what, um, what a caregiver leaving is. Remember we talked about like it's normal developmentally not to want to be separated from your caregiver and have some degree of stress. So at what age sort of do you guys think, and someone will have to shout it out or type it, I can't see the chat box, but at what age sort of culturally do we expect kids to be able to kind of leave the home and not be there all day? What's sort of our, our age that... Anybody want to throw out a, an idea? I have an 18 year old, soon to be 19 in September, and we're building a garage with an apartment over top of it. <laughs> So I, I feel like I can't answer this question. With a wide developmental margin. Well, this was this is this 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 is hard because our, our society is different than than our hardwiring and our brain was. But this was sort of the idea of the school age start. So 
you know, a lot of the, and a lot of this comes with cognitive development, the ability to realize what being separated from your caregiver should be. So a lot of true separation disorder that becomes sort of um, not developmental, but more problematic starts around starting school. So this is more some of that that kindergarten, first grade kind of thing. So some kids will experience this when they go to daycare because we, we have more prolonged separations for, for kids than, than maybe they had in the past. But the focus of separation anxiety disorder is they're really afraid of being away from their attachment figure. Um, they're worried about something happening to their parent or like something bad's gonna happen. Sometimes they can't even recognize that if they can't see the parent that they're still there. <laughs> Um, in their minds, they're so worried that only if they can see them is it okay. Um, and going to sleep can be awful for kids because if you think about sleep, it's the ultimate uh, disconnection. You you give yourself up. You're, you have to turn off your fear monitoring system to sleep. So that can be incredibly terrifying for people and they could have nightmares about this. And then they, they might have that array of those physical symptoms. So when that that, that those symptoms are that that firing of the fear centers and they're things like sweaty palms your heart racing fast breathing quickly um feeling this energy of agitated hyperactivity that goes with it you you all have if you've all ever thinking about the, the thing you fear the most all those things are part of those physical responses um, that, that might happen from a, a fear response. Now you can also have things that are a little less, um, things people forget about, but you can get stomach upset. You can get um, headaches. You can get sort of dull, achy pains that go with this. You can get a whole array of, of odd physical symptoms. And sometimes the physical complaints, which often end up in pediatric offices, are actually anxiety. And again, this usually has to cause significant problems. Selective mutism. Lauren, yes. Can you hear, can you hear me? This yes. is Joanna. I just wanted to say I was a nurse for 10 years with uh, pre-K and Head Start. And definitely those three to five-year-olds, you'd see a variety of some kids coming in with no issue separating. Uh, they were extremely clingy parents but I did find you know as as they got more comfortable with the staff you know through the throughout that time they they'd adapt but their peers were great with that too right and that's and that when you when when you're in that age group that three to five age group those are absolutely the things that help it's still in that developmental sort of anxiety so you 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 have to simulate an equally comfortable environment so if you if you can intervene so the idea with these anxieties are you can intervene early enough in a developmental anxiety you can kind of prevent and stabilize and teach the skill so that it doesn't go on and those are exactly what happens that's why it's a problem when teachers change classrooms a lot when kids are three or four if the room isn't healthy and so maintaining a lot of predictability and order is incredibly important in daycare this has also become a huge issue with covid right we had kids in daycares closing and so um it, it's huge where we're, we're, we spiked their developmental anxiety <laughs> um, and have to rework some of those things. So that's a perfect example. Um, and this is where you sometimes have to do a lot of parent education too, right? Because the, the parent can think beyond the day and they worry that they're leaving their kid too. And they get upset when really the kid calms down and that's developmentally appropriate. But the parent just saw them terrified. And, and so you're, you have to work through that. <laughs> that. Um, too, right, Donna? <laughs> so, good, great comment. Um, so, mutism is, is kids that don't want to talk. And this means they completely and utterly talk normally in every setting. They're capable of talking. They've demonstrated normal language skills. They talk with parents and people they're comfortable with. But they may go into an educational or a peer social situation and they just will not talk. Um, and it's not explained by any other cause. And often this is highly linked sometimes to social anxiety. Specific phobia is when it's a, a triggered event. So there's a specific thing that triggers a fear. Um, this could be things like needles or heights or something very specific. And again, um, sometimes it really can be the, the focus of, of things. 
social anxiety is again again a lot of the same like genetic and physical features are the same but the triggers are different so social anxiety is sort of and you tend to you tend to have to have a kid be about seven and cognitively start recognizing other people's perspectives to get this one so you see this kind of seem to increase in elementary school and then really into uh, middle and high schools is this idea that I'm being scrutinized by people, that people are judging me. My, and um, I feel like I'm gonna be negatively perceived. And so I, I'm kind of, I'm not comfortable being around people. I'm starting to avoid social interactions out of that sort of evaluation of, that, of, of myself being looked at poorly. This can be very common with depression because if you have depression and you're struggling with your own self-esteem and having depressive symptoms, it can also highlight at times some of the anxiety that you might have about, about engaging. Now, panic disorder is, again, a, that very hardwired, right? This is that intense fear response. And panic disorder can look different now. Lots of times people talk about panic disorder as most likely happening with the start of puberty. And so... You know, sometimes you'll see that separation or that tantruming behavior as, as panicky behavior, but as kids start starting puberty, you can start seeing the development of true panic attacks. Um, a panic attack is really this very intense 10 or 15 minute event, um, and people think they're having a heart attack. Um, and lots of adults go to the emergency room thinking they're dying from a heart attack because it's that intense. And you see, again, these are all those fear triggered behaviors from that amygdala. And so, this system can get really dysregulated um, and, and then people can really start thinking and, and doing this sort of cognitive distortion about what's going to cause a panic attack. So if I had my first panic attack in Walmart, I sort of make this cognitive connection that Walmart caused my panic attack. Or in kids, it's like school. I only have panic attacks at school. And so now I think that school causes a panic attack and I don't want to go to school. And you're trying to try, try to manage and control the fear of having the panic attack for your behaviors. And so sometimes, again, it's not the panic attack that causes as, as much problems. The panic attack feels bad, but it's the behaviors that come from the avoidance behavior related to the, the panic feeling. And so avoidance is a huge dysfunctional symptom of anxiety. And, and, and sometimes, like, while medicines might do a little bit of a job of targeting, like, this panic feeling um if if i don't change my perception in therapy that it wasn't walmart or it's not school that's causing the panic attack like you can't get anywhere the kid doesn't improve functionally so when we talk about treatment a little bit this linkage of of therapy to medication is really critical in anxiety disorders to overcome the avoidance because no medicine in the world will help you face your fear you have to pair the two together Generalized anxiety disorder is one of the most common anxiety disorders. This is sort of your classical worrying, your cognitive worrying, your overthinking, your, your, um, my mind, and it's usually associated with some physical symptoms as well. This is one of the differences between adults and kids. Adults will manifest kind of more physical symptoms with a kid. You only need one physical symptom. So you might feel like irritable or restless or tired um, or having muscle tension or sleep disturbance. Um, it, it's surprising how many kids, they, they stay really active or busy during the day, will describe how difficult sleep is because at night their mind just overthinks everything. It's, it's a quiet time where they have nothing to do and they just cannot turn their mind off. Um, they, they're just worrying so much. And then um, there are some different sort of types of anxiety disorders. You can have agoraphobia where people don't want to leave their homes. You can get sort of anxious symptoms from no. substance use and even certain medications. Um, kids, I, we've, I've seen kids having panic attacks from energy drinks and high levels of caffeine consumption um, because it can really, you know, stim you're stimulating or taking stimulant medication that can mimic anxiety responses. Um, anxiety disorders can be a major part of being a kid and having a medical condition. So lots of kids have anxiety about having a medical condition or related to that other medical condition that, that might also be there. Um, I, I did not include in this lecture and not in the medication piece 
but oftentimes people put pediatric OCD and pediatric P P PTSD in some of the same anxiety categories, and they are sort of anxiety anxiety disorders, but they're, they have some very unique features and they warrant some very specific discussions in their own right. So I didn't really focus on, on these for the second half. Um, there's some debate, pediatric OCD with sort of the obsessions and compulsions definitely as a cognitive factor, but there's a lot of impulse control disorders linked to OCD as well and tick disorders um, with this intrusive nature of the thinking and behaviors. So there's, there's OCD is sometimes conceptualized as an overlap between anxiety and impulse control disorders. And then PTSD um, in its own right as a trauma-related symptom and all the reestablishing of safety and, and often the attachment piece that goes with it. Um, and some of the techniques and medications can be quite different. Um, and so uh, just a few kind of last points, just sort of remembering that, that children are not little, uh, children are not just little adults. So just again, realizing that behavior when the parent comes talking about the tantrums or that, you know, we talked about that glazed over not responding sort of symptom. Even sometimes the kid that's just shadowing around the house and the parent just needs to be by themselves, but the kid is clingy and won't leave. Um, the stomach aches, the headaches, the constant sort of physical complaints that I need you there to feel better. We sometimes, again, just really mistake as a behavior problem that, that might really be anxiety and we're really trying to, to think about the cause. And the other thing is little kids cannot tell you that they avoid things. And if you think about, um, I had this little boy that really was very horribly anxious and he went to school and punched people. And why did he punch people? He punched people because he got sent home, because he was afraid to go to school. And so that punching was really avoidant behavior, but he didn't, he couldn't say that's why he was doing it. Um, it really took some detective work to realize that he had learned that the punching helped protect his anxiety. Um, and, it, and when you realize that, it really takes a lot of kind of undoing and a lot of collateral from people to understand what that purpose of that behavior might be. Because kids don't usually walk in, especially little kids don't usually walk in sound anxious. And then here are some just medical things to kind of remember um, that might overlap. Um, pheo, pheochromocytoma is a is a sort of a like a little kind of a tumor almost that sort of secretes sort of that norepinephrine and dopaminergic hormones that simulate it. It's very uh, rare, but when you have kids that have like a hypertension with their anxiety, that that's important to recognize. Thyroid problems are always important. Um, seizures strangely have a fair amount of, of oversight with anxiety because it can be like a aura, can be almost like a sense of um, foreboding that can be very anxious that overlaps with it. Um, and then certainly asthma and asthma medication, repetitively using um, albuterol can, can mimic and cause some anxiety symptoms as well. And uh, medications can, can cause anxiety. So you always want to try to to look at the medical li medication list as well. And then the hard part with this is then just remembering how much overlap that they occur. So this is really just a, 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 a slide to remember. And again, they may have both, but as we talk about some of the things, right, aggression might sound like an impulse control disorder. Fear might just, oh, we just think it's a trauma. Um, you know, they, there can be a lot of overlap. And, and sometimes you have anxiety, but maybe there's really a, Maybe that kid was punching someone because he had a learning disability and the school was anxious because he couldn't read and you have to dig a little bit to, to, to see um, where it all began. And then here's the point in the final few seconds that we really need to make an effort to really screen kids. Um, and, and there's lots of different screeners out here. And, and I wanted to just share with you the scared. This is free. And I, I have copies of this that they're going to email out with the presentation. But these are things you can use in your office. And I'm going to pull it up for you. Oh, that's not it. Uh, this one. Okay, so there's a parent and a child version. Oh, sorry. There's a parent and a child version of this. One the kid can fill out and the one the parent fills out. Um, and it, it, it kind of, it's really, it's front and back. So it's fairly long, but it's really good for psychoeducation too. So it lists and, it, and it's, it's scorable and it's real simple to score. It tells you which one goes with which one and it'll, it'll say on the bottom. 
um, here, like when you score it, if it if they're if they're talking about generalized anxiety or separation anxiety, um, but it just it, it's a, lots of different ways to ask about anxiety, and this type of screener for a parent or a child can be really helpful. And again, if a kid sometimes do a lot better than this than you think, if you are too scared to talk to me, it's a lot safer to fill out the form. And so I have a lot of teenagers that will endorse things on a form because it's safe, but when I ask them how they're doing, I'm, I'm fine, I'm okay, because they're trying to leave. And so figuring out um, easy ways to kind of screen kids in a safe way can really kind of help you get quickly to the root of the problem. And so I would urge you if, if, you, if you have a quick resource, and this is also the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's page um, that is, is up here. And they have this family and youth tab that when you click on the family services, there's a whole set of family resources here. And there's a whole, um, there's a whole resource center on anxiety disorders. And it talks about the different types of anxiety. It talks about what's normal or not normal and how they're treated. And they, they have all these handouts you can provide to families um, about coping, chronic illness, PTSD, that, that are, there are two page handouts that are psychoeducation materials for, for parents that are, are worth checking out. Um, there's a whole bunch about the different types of medications and handouts for parents as well. And we will probably save the medication and treatment piece for next time because we are out of time. <laughs> so. That was so excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Swagger. And I'll, I'll certainly attach those uh, uh, documents too into the recap email along with your PowerPoint. Um, and we'll definitely have to coordinate the second half of this presentation. It was so excellent. I can't wait to hear the other part of it. So um, thank you so much for that wonderful didactic. And Caitlin, thank you for the case once again. If there are any questions from uh, today's didactic, please feel free to just e email me. I can send them over to Dr. Swagger. Um, and just one quick announcement before we part ways. Our next session will be on July 15th and Amanda Newhouse will be uh, providing the didactic on screen time. So keep an eye out for all those reminders and thank you all again for joining. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.